hard point, according to me, uh, on which we, we could have worked more, uh, which has been the integration between the two communities. I don't think this works. Uh, is it um, switch on? Uh, these actions was about the value of information of structural rate monitoring. Uh, so there were two communities at the beginning, they still uh, are here. The community of uh, decision analysis and the community of structural rate monitoring. Um, in the first part of the action, I think uh, uh, we could have been uh, more uh, uh, we could have worked more on uh, looking for the integration. Integration uh, has not been uh, so effective, I think, uh, first of all, for a question of glossary, as I said during my presentation. We use different languages, and we still do. We still do at the end of the action, and I realized this in, during a meeting we had uh, one month ago in Amsterdam in the standardization working group. There are still some terms that uh, the two communities uh, use in different ways. Um, so maybe a, a sort of lesson learned for me is that uh, if there are uh, different uh, uh, expertise which necessarily have to be there in a cost action because this is the one of the meaning one of the interesting things uh, the first step should be trying to to find a common level of understanding um, maybe i don't know using some uh, Training school for participants. Training school are not just for uh, for PhD students. Um, I I uh, attended the, well, the first uh, training school, and uh, I learned uh, from that. Then I understand that many of us does, don't have time to really study many things. But uh, uh, a first step could have been that uh, uh, could have been important. I think. Okay. Who wants to take up this point from the panel? It's just my idea. There is someone else that uh, thinks that uh, this didn't happen and could have been good. Maybe. Can you take a microphone? Some proposal about how we could have done that? Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, f uh, my perspective would be that, uh, that we uh, may have not fully achieved this, uh, as you say, but uh, I think we have triggered the interest of uh, especially the structural health uh, monitoring community. And uh, yeah, my perspective uh, would be in this sense that it takes just time um, so that uh, that the common understanding uh, grows and has time to grow. Yes, but I, I think that in in for the in academia for the academic people, I think this is something that is generally and it's also difficult to do because you are in the SHM community. You publish in the journals for SHM. I mentioned today this example. No, you have the same. Uh, a, and it means something different in one community than the other. Now, we agree on something jointly, but then if you go to your community, where it's basically where you make your living, let's say, you still have to speak their language, otherwise they will not understand you. But in my experience, it's typically more fruitful to come together in... Or it's, so it's, it seems to me that coming together is more difficult in academia than actually in practice, because in practice, when companies, organizations actually try to, to use these things and they have to use different tools, they are really forced to, to do it. And then they have, to. but I, I also don't have the answer how to, I mean, as you say, maybe you have, people have to, should attend the school, we should uh, try to train the participants. Um, uh, but I'm not sure if you can make them afterwards go back and, 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 and 
and use, I mean, one thing is to, to be able to, to at least understand that the other community has different terminologies and what, if they say, I you know, indicator, it means something else than if it, if it's in my community. Um, to be able to really develop a common language seems on the, uh, on the uh, how to say, um, more related to the work inside the action rather than outside. I think uh, uh, Jochen this morning said that at the beginning we had the 20, pro not, I don't know, they didn't say the number. We have m many proposals for case studies, but then the number reduced. So. Uh, probably there were many reasons why not all the case studies uh, arrived to the end. But I'm sure that some of these case studies didn't arrive at the end because people didn't have the tool. And uh, uh, they didn't have the tool because they didn't understand the language or the, the method or whatever. Um, I actually was, f was forced to understand the, the, pre, the prior, pre-posterior and so on by Piotr, who is there. We had several discussions in the first year of the action, and it was really, really tough for me to understand. But in the end, uh, <laughs> uh, arguing with, uh, with Piotr, we, I, I was able. But uh, uh, if he didn't uh, uh, force me, push me to do this, I would have never done that. Well, of course, now I have uh, Francesco is doing this PhD on, the, on this topic, so I had some chances, but I understand that if uh, there are no chances, just uh, participating, to attending to the meeting wouldn't, uh, for me, wouldn't have yeah. been uh, enough. Mm, I think so. this goes also along the lines uh, that we, that I criticized, we had two, uh, few training schools, just two towards yeah, the end. Yeah, I agree. So we should have done this uh, much earlier. Yeah. yeah. You're a success mm. story then. Mm. I'm, I'm always a success yeah, story. <laughs> 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 so, uh, Ellen, please. But, but I wonder, rather than a shortcoming, is that actually a, a strength of the action that, you know, we often judge pieces of work like this, not only on the work that was completed and the volume of work that was completed, but on how, how well we understand the future work that needs to be completed. Yeah. And, and to some extent, I wonder, is that, mm -hmm. is that actually a success story here that with, with all of the work which has been done, that some really key questions and actions for how this can really be taken forward in a next phase have now been identified. Because I know from the, from the context of the SDSMs, I think that they were, they were hugely successful and they were so vast and covered so many topics. But, but I'm, I'm always conscious of, Helder and I have had discussions about this and with you, Sebastian, about we wanted more industry participation in the SDSMs yep. and that's a way to, yep. to get people talking a common language. But that said, the SDSMs which are completed were, were really very valuable, but in a next phase, maybe we might identify, okay, now is the time to, to, to get the message, to get the interaction with the industry going and to, to make that a higher priority maybe in a, in a next evolution. So to, so to some extent, I feel that some of these questions which have arisen today about, about future work is actually really positive because four years ago when we started this action, none of those questions were circulating. So that's no. actually, no. you know, okay. uh, has been a, a success story. It's a magnetic pull here on the microphone. <laughs> a magnetic. <laughs> Go on. Well, um, I, I I think it's uh, it's it's fundamentally difficult to press uh, uh, the interaction through. It it has to be provoked uh, somehow. S slowly uh, and and surely, persistently, and uh, t to that I, I think that uh, well I agree with Ellen that I think it has rather been somewhat successful. I I saw a turning point uh, at the workshop in uh, Munich some some time ago where we succeeded uh, really well in getting a lot of different perspectives up on the wall uh, at the same time and uh, there were some uh, uh, I would not say heated uh, discussions but uh, there were some uh, more frank uh, discussions up until that point in Munich 
when people were saying something, uh, everybody would be nodding and, uh, and confirming that they understand everything. And, and this, this is just the way we are. Uh, we want to be positive. People are like that. Humans are like that. We would like to be confirmative and, uh, uh, and then uh, slowly we will, we will try to figure out what is really being said and uh, figure out also to what extent we agree with what is being said. It's a slow process. It's difficult to force through. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm more of the opinion of uh, Alan. Uh, we are positive people. We come from small countries, minorities, uh, unlike the other people in the panel, and we are modest. <laughs> Do you want to say? Well, um, if I may add to the entropy of the discussion, <laughs> and <clears throat> now from someone outside of his expertise on vision, probabilistic, and all these dense issues of mathematical approach, <clears throat> If I can say something that uh, could be explored further or any other way around that was not so explored during the cost action, depends on the perspective that people want to see it. One of the things that from a decision maker is highly important <clears throat> is assessing and quantifying these consequences. <clears throat> I remember a presentation from Michael on a course that I attended once. <clears throat> and he you talk about direct costs and indirect costs, and that the indirect costs can go up to an order of two, three of the direct costs, for example, which I think is something that, <clears throat> if I look to the formulation of the preposterior analysis, if you change these consequences, you change completely your, uh, uh, let's say, optimum or the benefit solution. And something that I will put here for consideration in the future, I think it is missing here for developing further an area <clears throat> that is economics, mainly on the indirect cost assessment. For example, the collapse of this bridge in Italy, yes? So, a very important link in Genoa. What were the implications of uh, these indirect costs on the daily life of the people? Now I need to change my routine, uh, the local uh, <clears throat> commerce. All these quantifications, not only from the probabilistic side, so the, the P and the risk formula, but also on the costs that is multiplying this risk, this probability. I think it should be from an uh, operator or concessionaire point of view, it will be very efficient to attract a lot of their attention that these costs are being also analyzed more efficiently. I know that it might be very difficult, but for sure, maybe it is missing for the future a component here which is economics. How we assess some of these costs, nothing related with the structure, but the impact on the societal and the, uh, the environmental, uh, this is a comment from my perspective in terms of the owner or the concessionaire that is responsible for managing 2,000 bridges and if one of them collapse, what will be the costs of, yeah? So, and this is a big, plays a big role in the decision on your pre posterior analysis. Should I do this? Should I do that? You never will get reliable, or, or not reliable, but... <laughs> uh, a strong approach uh, uh, if you don't have this cost properly calculated. So this is a provoke question. Is it, it was a question to someone or? Yeah, I think we should, <laughs> uh, we should also engage with yeah. the audience. Someone has comments, answers? Any comments, questions you would like to ask? analyzing costs of failure of a bridge with three parameters. Human risk, human risk because you take a detour route, you might make 30 kilometers more, so you have another human risk, and then 
uh, it depends on the number of vehicles which are on the bridge, on the span. Not only the, the span length of the bridge is not the only parameter which is affecting that. So there are some in very interesting studies, especially in the UK, which are dealing with this. And I think that uh, it can be implemented. Maybe this parameter is missing, but it can be implemented. There are studies, and there is a possibility to deal with. Mm -hmm. Yes, but I think that yeah, this point is a valid point, and measuring direct consequences is probably relatively straightforward, but I think that the understanding and, and, and quantification of indirect consequences, the, the, I mean, as you said, it's, it's, a, it's a task for economists. We don't have really economists yes, that, in this, in this uh, cost action. And probably it was good because that we didn't have economists. Because if you think about the, already these different engineering communities uh, yes. having to find the common language is already the challenge. And I'm, a, I'm not sure if we would have had here a group of economists. It would have been interesting for some discussions, but maybe it would have been too much of a challenge for this cost action. Yeah. And, and, uh, but uh, I mean, I know sense. that uh, the uh, that. Uh, organizations uh, that run and operate these infrastructure systems, they have uh, not, not a very good understanding of what is the cost of these things. And, and different economists, indirect costs, and different economists give very different answers to the question. So I think that this is, so, so, so it's a very uh, relevant question. I'm, not I'm also not sure to what degree we as engineers can actually contribute I mean, we, t we try to do it because we, we are the ones that end up in these organizations that make the decisions. And so if we don't have answers from economists, we, we come up with our own models. But maybe this is really a, a challenge that should be posed to the economists, and they should give answers to that. Um, I think they have typically not their main interest. So, but, uh, but just no, I mean, but just a remark, and Dimitri, as I think he mentioned, if you think about these executive boardings of these big companies, the majority of them are economics or lawyers. So, they're business people. I know, but I'm, no, no, I, I know, but uh, I'm trying to say is that also, also to help to attract their attention, this perspective or at least this input, I'm not saying that the economists should be here from the beginning to the end of the formulation of a problem, no, I think it's an input that it's fundamental for uh, catching properly their interest on what we are doing here from the Bayesian and probability perspective and asset management. Well, I think uh, what you are calling for is uh, to, uh, a, a more, uh, a bigger scope for the uh, for the system uh, which you are actually um, trying to represent, uh, and um, I think the answer also is uh, is resilience. Uh, so what you really need to do is that you need to look at the coupled system of the of the uh, hardware, uh, the infrastructure, or whatever. Uh, uh, it is that is being monitored, and then you need to set it in the organizational context, uh, modeling the provision of benefit uh, achieved uh, from the uh, infrastructure system and the capacity building that facilitates uh, for the system in the larger context. And there it's difficult to try to put the boundaries on the system. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and try to model all the interdependencies uh, in these combined regulatory, societal, uh, governance, uh, and, uh, and, and the hardware, the infrastructure system. And there's a lot of research going on on that, and engineers are deeply involved. Uh, so I think this will be the place where the things will melt together. And structural health monitoring or whatever active uh, means for governance, which is essentially what monitoring is, it's, it's just uh, 
a means of picking up information about the system. It could also be monitoring of agents in society, so we can monitor on the exposure side, we can monitor on the structural uh, response side, we can monitor anything, the service output. Uh, um, it's a governance with the feedback loop. So based on what we monitor, we can make we can we can make decisions to to tune the system performance in any of these dimensions. And it's evolving, but I, I think that there's still a lot of work to be done. And especially if we want to succeed in this, I see a huge challenge for the construction industry and and those um, working with the built environment, and that is really to facilitate that technology 4.0 or 5.0 can, can get into the, into the game. Uh, because the way we have been running our business in the construction industry is, a, is, a, is a, well, there's not much positive to say about it. It's, uh, it's simply like uh, medieval times, uh, the way we are approaching the management of the built environment. Uh, a structure which has been built uh, like two years ago, it will be hardly possible to find any base information about the structure. Um, we, we really need to facilitate that technology can get into the game. Uh, and as I've said at a couple of smaller workshops here lately, I think if we don't do it, we may uh, risk, or it may be, actually it may be positive, but we could see actors like uh, Amazon, or Google uh, simply taking over uh, our business b because they are the technology providers. They can do it. Uh, they can do all these things which we are very reluctant to introduce into the management of the built environment. Uh, to do that, maybe we should start thinking about what's next. How? Yeah. How can we come all together to, to work on it and uh, how can we uh, provide us the mean to do that? Uh, so what, what type of project we, can we um, put, uh, put up all together to, to have the, the funds to do that, to do research on this topic? Uh, so I think the next step uh, we we should uh, go. Yeah. Let's discuss about uh, the next steps. What are the ideas, and what would be the best ways to proceed? But I think that what Michael said. Uh, I think this digitization that is now happening, and at least starting to happening, because it's as you said, as of now, not uh, much still not very much uh, seen in practice, but uh, there's now quite a lot of money spent on, uh, on this digitization of the construction industry and, and, and the built environment. And maybe that is a, a, a huge amount of money, potentially. You know? That might be a possibility to, that we, we try to go in this direction. Because, of course, monitoring is, is closely linked. It will also make our tasks much easier if... But well, BIM is, uh, yes, is one of is, or, or all these related uh, topics. Yes. Um, that might be an angle of, of, of how we, uh, one possible angle of how, how we can yep. try to, mm -hmm. to sell that, that what we're doing is, is a part of that. And is, is how, how do we make better use of the information and that is now collected? Maybe our industrial advisory board can suggest something. <laughs> no, I, I'm not joking. I mean, uh, this is where uh, the money comes. There, there are a few, a few things that come into this, uh, into this picture. You know, the one thing, if we have a model that uh, covers not only uh, the engineering part, but also the social sciences, then the costs would be interesting for insurance companies, for example. If we can tell them, this is our model, give us the costs, we will get it. Uh, if you're looking for the costs, for example, of the loss of life, you go to World Bank. There are statistics, you can, you can have that. But uh, an integrated model would be for the insurers. 
and uh, for the digitization, uh, you know, I, I was in Beijing last October and uh, on, on ISO on an ISO big ISO meeting, and they has established uh, an, a new group on, on BIM, uh, which will bring in a new code, and the Chinese are, are leading that. And uh, in China, if you have a project more than 10 million euro of size, it has to be BIM. In Germany, if you go for Deutsche Bahn, it has to be BIM. So, you know, BIM is a, is a, is a model. So this would be our playground. We, we should uh, mm -hmm. try to bring it. Well, we, we could deliver to them, not say to us. So, but we could use their information. You know, all, all our models are lacking good data. So if we get the good data from another community, well, wonderful. We could give them the algorithms. Just on the comments which have been made, and, and I'm conscious of what Helder said and, and what Michael said, and I think that somebody earlier on today spoke about a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. And I think that we, we as engineers all too often fall into this bottom-up approach. And then we don't think about the organizational structures or the governance structures, as, as Michael referred to. So I think there's an opportunity for us in that space. And this, this goes back to the point of working with insurance companies or governments or, or owners of big infrastructure, to, to not just look at the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the, the, the bottom-up approach, but actually to consider these kind of governance aspects, social science aspects, and look at, look at working at both levels. And then I think we come up with I know somebody, I think you said today, we're never going to have the complete model, and I, and I agree with you, but we, we move closer to that point where we get a synergy between the various considerations which really brings out the value of information in, in this space. And I think that whilst I agree with the point about, about BIM, again, that's bottom up. We're, th we're thinking as engineers about the bottom up approach. We're not thinking from the, mm -hmm. the top down and, and, and merging the two. So maybe, maybe we just need to broaden our perspectives out a little bit to facilitate um, uh, that, that kind of thinking at, at the kind of organizational level, I think. Because that's the key. If you're a, if you're a, a national authority who, who has given a concession to a concessionaire, you know, y y we have to give them metrics that they understand in terms of performance of the network that the, the operators have to live up to and then demonstrate how, with the bottom-up approach, they can validate achievement of those metrics. So I think there's a, there's a kind of a, an important symbiosis there. Yes, I think it's, uh, if you look to the subject outside, <clears throat> Bayesian updating probably is, perhaps is one of the most densest uh, subject in mathematics maybe, so imagine now for uh, uh, someone that even though is not, uh, just needs to decide, but it's not, so it's quite hard as you said, in the bottom, look to this, I don't, Please don't, I don't have time to read this, but as I said, this is the bottom line, so this is the ground, so this is where things are built in a sustainable approach and robust, but then we cannot, we need also, and think, I think also uh, that was the suggestion for these two special sessions on case studies, uh, please uh, keep uh, one third of your paper to communicate with these people uh, in a more tangible way so they can understand what you are trying to say and not using uh, very technical terms. But um, I, th I always believe that people are convinced by the arguments, not because you are po we are forcing people to do things. So if you are able to, to present uh, convincing arguments about um, uh, a, a very uh, convincing case study on a specific uh, structure. Uh, I think these things takes time as well because from my experience, you need to put yourself in their perspective to write properly uh, a paper for this, for example. I'm, for example, on this <coughs> guide for operators, despite the fact that I'm trying just to keep to five pages, it's very hard to write it because uh, I'm not writing to myself, I'm writing to other people. So you need to move outside of your comfortable zone and try to communicate for them. And this is something that we should do more and more, uh, not forgetting what is in the bottom, but we should. It's, 
but depends on the perspective of the people. <clears throat> I don't know, uh, if you are an academic and you, you are pushed to, to write papers and uh, funding, okay, it's your priority, but uh, in this case, I think if you are dealing with real structures and they are there and someone are responsible for their management, we as experts, we should spare some time to help them to push this knowledge on their benefit. And for this, and as Maria started in the beginning, for example, this <coughs> different vocabulary needs to be better uh, standardized or a better or, uh, uh, communication. I think it's also a matter of communication. Sometimes things are here and people don't know that they are available because we are not able to communicate properly the value of this work for the real world. This is my experience. Well, I think from this point of view, from this point of view, we did a great job the, with respect to the outside because the three guidelines that uh, the, the working group five are preparing are exactly what the, uh, the, the world outside needs because are, they cover the three levels that uh, we, we wanted to cover uh, science, uh, industry, and uh, decision maker and uh, policy makers. So we did a great job, I think, from that point of view, um, and um, which is not common. I mean, another construction. I didn't. Uh, uh, there is not the same approach. So, and I think it will be very. Uh, very useful uh, because uh, policy makers at the end, as you said <laughs> today, are the ones that have the money that decide. So they, they, they really have to understand. Um, yeah. So this is a great success, I think, of the action. Okay, any more points? We are well, coming to uh, one, one could uh, wonder so, what happens? What happens next? What is the next? What is the next action of this action? Um, is is there another action which should be made uh, in the, in the future? I'm I'm sure we will see several actions related to resilience of different types of systems. The thing is uh, that addressing resilience of systems, things become. Um, a, a little bit specific uh, if we are looking at uh, general uh, traffic infrastructure, we are looking for energy uh, provision and distribution systems, or we are looking at communication systems, it, it would be different audiences uh, altogether. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that, that this, is, uh, this is a way to go uh, in this group. What I could um, what I could see a merit in is the transition of the so the 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 the, the challenge would be for me the transition transition of the construction industry from now to technology 4.0. What what is what does this transition comprise? What is it we need to move? in order to facilitate for technology in the management of the built environment. And like the concept of digital twins, so we all know this, uh, but what is it really that we need? Uh, and, and how can we, um, what are the constituents uh, that would facilitate that that we would be able to manage the built environment in the context of, um, of society in, in the future. And I think this is a worthy, this is a worthy uh, ex expenditure of time. It is desperately needed because we don't know it. And if we don't know it, uh, then who should, who would know it? Um, I, I think we are as central as anybody can be in this business. Um, so that I could definitely recommend to consider some way, and I also think that it can be sold very well to the European 
commission this type of activity. There's another tangib uh, tangible outcome which uh, I also would recommend strongly, uh, and that is that we have had several uh, causes uh, within, the, within the action um, uh, dedicated to different aspects of, um, of uh, value of or de de decision ranking on, uh, let's say, a collection of information for the management uh, of, of the built environments, infrastructure systems, or structures in, in, in particular. And I think that it would be an easy, uh, relatively easy thing to convert those course activities into maybe one module, one, one week or 10 day module, which could be anchored uh, like permanently in the um, continuing uh, education and advanced school of the uh, joint committee. Uh, that would be a lasting, uh, at least as long as it lasts. <laughs> but but it would be it would yeah. be something, and we are all pointing to the fact that we need education, right? Uh, much more education. So that that might be yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for the uh, very concrete ideas, um, which we should follow up. Uh, also, building our ideas, coming back uh, to this community. Uh, the project is running <laughs> still for more than two months. Um, and uh, I think now we have a time challenge, Ellen, right? Uh, we need to come uh, towards an end of this uh, discussion. So I think uh, we should close the first day of the final conference. Uh, which was basically about the, of summing up, wrapping up of what we have done. The second day uh, is rather focused on uh, uh, what we still need to do so that we all, uh, that we cannot uh, disseminate uh, what we have done and what we have produced. So in this way, I'm concluding the first day of this final T142 conf conference. Thank you very much.